Hey, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. Today we're talking about relationships as they relate to systems thinking. So well, let me unpack what that means here. We did a podcast a long time ago about systems thinking where we basically said that we don't believe anymore in this idea of cause and effect thinking. There's not one cause for anything that happens in the world. Everything that happens, everything that happens in your life, in life around you, in other people's lives is an emergent property of an entire system that's running. So there's all these nodes in a system that create an emergent of something happening. For example, the, the example we gave is a car starting, you know, a vehicle turning on. It's not that you stick the key in the ignition of the vehicle and you turn the key and the car turns on, a cause and effect thinking. It's actually when you turn that key, an entire system, a chain reaction goes off. All these different processes happen in the vehicle to start the engine. And basically, we look at relationships in a very similar fashion. It's not that anything in your relationship, your romantic relationship in particular, what we're talking about today, happens by cause and effect. It's all an emergent of entire systems running. And we thought we could talk about this today. And the reason why we chose this topic is because we believe it's a great benefit for you listening to apply to your current romantic relationship or one you want to have in the future because all of them are systems in and of themselves and they have emergence that are influenced by all the what we call nodes in those systems. Yeah, so a node is essentially using your car model, I mean, excuse me, your car metaphor is uh, each one of the parts of the car would be considered a node, right? It's an, it, just think of it as a part. And systems are made up of nodes or all these different parts that influence each other and interact. And the reason why we feel like anytime we can talk about systems thinking and apply it to people's everyday life, we can encourage others to also get rid of this cause effect thinking, which we, I've come to the conclusion that it's sometimes so inaccurate it's such an inaccurate way of looking at life that it, it renders it futile to continue to look at things in, in cause and effect. And in particular with relationships, I think this is a very powerful way of understanding systems because in the, in the society that we are in and we were raised in and the education system we were raised in, I think thinking in terms of cause and effect is like the standard way of describing how reality works. Yeah. And so it's very easy for us to adopt a cause and effect way of thinking. And in a relationship, this can be disastrous. Because if we're looking at an effect that we don't like, we look at something, a feeling we're having or a thought we're having or a result that we don't particularly like. And if we continue to think in terms of cause and effect, well, we're looking at this effect. So then we go back you know, try to reverse it to, to go find the cause. And a lot of times that ends up being our spouse. Like we're looking for somebody to blame, effectively take the blame for this. Why am I feeling the way that I'm feeling? Or why am I thinking the thing I'm thinking? Why don't we have enough money? Why are our kids disrespectful? Like we're, we're looking for something to pin this result we don't like on. But when we reverse that thinking or actually remove it and replace it with systems thinking, now we can't just go look for a victim, I mean a villain. We can't just see ourselves as a victim of something that we don't like and then go try to find the culprit or a villain in the situation. Yeah. Now we have to look at the complexity of what's actually going on. One of the reasons why we don't like systems thinking as a society, it seems, is because systems are complex. And we have a tendency to want to make everything as simple as humanly possible in order to understand it. But we dumb things down, and like I, I mentioned before, we dumb things down to a point where they're so inaccurate that they're futile. Like you, if you get it to a point where you remove all systems and only think in cause and effect, you might as well, you might as well blame anything. Like you don't like the result. Well, I don't know, like blame it on a, you know, the bananas that are sitting in the kitchen, like not, not being able to actually look at the system as it is means that we end up arbitrarily placing blame on things. And if you get in the habit of doing that to your mate, or the person you're in a relationship with, if they end up being the catch-all to all the problems that you face, eventually the emotion that we cannot help but feel is contempt. Because this is the person who is the cause of all of my problems, eventually. And contempt is the one emotion that a relationship cannot survive. 
So one of the reasons why we feel that looking at relationships through the lens of systems thinking is so important is that it removes this sort of, um, I don't know, like an instinct to turn our spouses or our mates into the villain in our life. Yeah. The catch-all person who we've just arbitrarily decided is the cause of all of our problems <laughs> and yeah. then destroy our relationship through the feeling of contempt that ends up being an emergent as well. The other, the other great part about systems thinking when you apply it to relationship is it gives you this measure of feeling empowered to do something about stuff you don't like because you look at it and you go, okay, my spouse and I are fighting a lot right now. For some reason, we've been great for three years and all of a sudden, in the last month, out of the blue, we're fighting. It'd be easy to say, well, man, my spouse must have changed or my lover, my pair bond partner must have changed and they don't like me anymore or I'm no longer appealing to them. Maybe they're not attracted to me or they've got something that is bothering them or whatever the cause, quote unquote, might be. And you almost feel hopeless or helpless in the situation. You say, well, I guess this is what's happening. And, and maybe you struggle to try to like make yourself more attractive or when you're fighting, you try to out argue that person or try to prove your point. And, and then it's the cycle and you don't understand why it's happening and it's frustrating. When you look at it from a systems perspective, you can say, you can step back for a second and say, okay, what is happening in this system? What are all the things that are here in the system and what in the system, what nodes, you know, we talked about the nodes, what nodes in the system changed that got us this emergent of us fighting all of a sudden this month? Like, what, what was the change that happened? It allows you to go in and say, maybe I can put a, address the issues, maybe I can put attention and address the issues around the parts of the system that are creating this new emergent. And so it gives you a sense of empowerment and possibility thinking rather than feeling hopeless and victimy, which is really a great standpoint to come from when you're trying to fix things, well, make things better. I don't, I don't use the word fix in relationship because I don't, it doesn't necessarily have to be looked at as broken. It could just look at like, it's not performing well. It's not optimized right now. And you're trying to optimize it to the best relationship you possibly can. Yeah. I think that's a really good point that when things are looked at through the lens of systems, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, like a blame game. Sometimes the system has something that's changed in it that has nothing to do with anybody being at fault. It's just something that happened. Like take, for example, what you're talking about. Like we've been in this relationship for a couple of years and all of a sudden we're fighting. Well, one thing that could be happening, a node that could have changed is that the honeymoon period, which is like a known time period where you have this cocktail of chemicals running through your system based on this new relationship and it can last for a couple of years maybe the cocktail just stopped being produced <laughs> and that's nobody's fault like you just ran the course of the honeymoon period and then all of a sudden the honeymoon period is over and if you reference the the podcast we did with bruce music on the power struggle once the cocktail's gone couples tend to enter into what's called the power struggle phase and that's nobody's fault Nobody did anything wrong. It's just the node of the cocktail was changed and removed. And the other, the other node in that system would also be the timeline of the relationship. The timeline itself is a node in that system. So there's the chemicals, the physical chemicals and pheromones and all that stuff that's being released into your, your brain and body. And then also the timeline is a node. So you've got two different elements right there just, just looking at that simple system running. And there's yeah. obviously a bunch of other things happening too. Yeah, exactly. And so in that situation, you look at that node and go, okay, so the cocktail of chemicals is gone, but what can it be replaced with? Let's attend to that node. And every part of the system, every node in the system influences all the other nodes. And so then you have to ask yourself questions like, okay, so if the cocktail is gone and we're no longer feeling this like really sort of it's not a synthetic boing feeling but it is something that can't be it's not like sustainable forever just relying on that honeymoon period and so then the question becomes what do we replace it with let's make sure that we're doing say regular date nights with each other let's make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep our intimacy going maybe removing the chemicals and replacing them with something else something that feels more sustainable is now our our task so in if that node is removed or changed or altered it can start feeling like everything else is changed and altered too like you're no longer maybe you know speaking as gently with each other maybe now you have more assertive language with each other and now 
it's very easy to look at the person and go like, well, you didn't used to talk like this to me, but now you're just being a jerk all the time. No, the person isn't. They just don't have that part of them running the way that they did before and neither do you. And so what's nice about looking at things through in, in terms of systems is that you don't have to necessarily personalize it. It's not like an individual that is necessarily at fault. And even if a person's mood is cranky or they're bringing a bad energy to the relationship, as opposed to using that person's bad energy as the cause of your problems, if you look at it through systems, you can look at the person's bad energy and go, that's also an emergent of a system running. What's the system running that is causing bad energy or bad juju or negativity to come up. And so now it's just a matter of deconstructing what that system is. And maybe your spouse is feeling a lot of stress for some reason, or maybe they're not getting enough sleep, or maybe they're not attending to their nutrition like they should be. Like there's a lot of different components that come up into why a person is showing up the way that they are. And then if you can go back to the system and do what you can about helping change that system, then now the emergent is no longer bad energy. Now the emergent is more positive frame. And now that's feeding into the system of the relationship. And now the relationship is doing better. So yeah, it's a matter of being willing to allow the truly complicated nature of reality, like being willing to sit with that and not have to make things so oversimplified that they're no longer accurate. Like being willing to dive a little deeper into the actual systems that are at play in in our lives and then get really good at pattern recognizing what are the normal systems in a relationship. Yeah. And I think, so I'm going to give an example from last week with us. We went away briefly to have Piper spend some time with your parents last week. And we go to a hotel because we're going to go to a different city than we're in right now and drop Piper off with your parents at this location. So we're going to spend like two nights there and Piper goes off with your parents. And (laughs) within a few hours, you and I start fighting. (laughs) Like we start arguing, we start having conflict in our relationship. And we're, I was all excited because I wanted to be like a romantic getaway and you were excited too. And it was by the beach and it was going to be really exciting. You know, it was really going to be a nice thing. And we found ourselves disagreeing and and having arguments and at kind of at each other for a while, like for the first day, really. And I think we came to realize there are ultimate several nodes running. I'm just going to basically name a few of these simple ones. The one thing was, it's been weeks of us running. We've been on the road, we've been traveling to different cities. Uh, we're wintering in Florida right now here in the United States for a while. Um, we have we just been running and running, hosting different staff members and students from our profiler training program. And we've been we've had to been on a lot and we've been doing a lot of recording to front load the podcast to make sure we're releasing on a regular schedule. Like we've been just really busy trying to close out old projects from last year, different things that have been going on for us. And this is the first moment we've had, just the two of us, without anybody else, any children, anybody else around, to just be the two of us. And so obviously anything that has been unresolved in our relationship up until that point now explodes or at least it comes to the surface, bubbles the surface during this downtime we have because we can actually rest for a moment. And now all the healing or any type of issues that we've had have the ability to come forward. We don't have to suppress those now to be on about recording or working or handling kids or traveling or whatever we're trying to do logistically. Like There's an opportunity for us to actually work on ourselves a little bit. And so all that just floods in. That's one node in the system is just the idea of having downtime in and of itself without any children around. And then your parents are there and we didn't realize this till probably two days later, but there were all old neural patterns you had around what your parents mean and how their influence in your life and their opinion of you and your value and worth. And so that triggered a bunch of stuff into you, which is a note in the system in your own brain and your own heart of how you feel about your relationship with your parents and your worth as a person that I'm not privy to. I just think you're getting upset with me about little things and picking and we're, and then I'm, I'm reacting with all my insecurities are coming up, which you're not privy to. I mean, I, we've had some talks about them and all of a sudden I'm going, well, I've got these insecurities too. It like activates my insecurities. Now my node's running and it starts to create this dynamic where we're arguing and we're at each other when we should be enjoying ourselves at the beach in a really romantic setting and just having fun. But those nodes 
boom, they enter into the relationship in this short period of time and we have to deal with it when it comes up. And I think we sat down, I think on day two and we're like, okay, what in the world is happening right now? And we started to diagram out almost, we didn't write it on paper, but we talked through some of the things that were coming up for us in just this short period of time. Now, if we were in a cause and effect mindset, we might, which we were originally, you know, it's just, it's so easy to go there to to stop and think about things in systems is a, a discipline that you develop over time. If you're listening and you're like, oh man, the systems thing, that sounds complicated. It is complicated and it takes practice and discipline. So it's yeah. challenging, yeah. right? It's not, a, it's not, it's the skill you build. It's not just comes easy. So we looked for cause and effect. It was like, well, you feel this way. That makes me feel this way. Well, no, you feel this way. That makes me feel this way. Well, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. We're going on and on and on. We're like, wait a minute, what is going on here? And we stopped and we started talking about the different things that were going on for us. As we talked, we realized that both of us were on the same team. Both of us love each other and we want the best for each other. It actually had nothing to do with us. There were a bunch of other things that were running that were influencing the system between us. And it just so happened the emergent was us having a little bit of disagreement and some arguments and some some old pain and wounds we were trying to process. And we were using the other person to try to process through those. So I guess I say that as an example to say that sometimes things are short-lived. You know, the, all these nodes can flow in and out of things. Um, it's not like it's the end of the world. And, and I think what's exciting about that is that's a micro view of something that happens, I think, to couples on a, on a much m- bigger macro scale. But sometimes those things can go on for years, months, years, decades even, depending on the couple and the dynamics that are set up, the, the systems that are running. So I think this is a, it's just a good example of what can come up for, for people in relationship. Well, I, I mean, I want to flay that out just a little bit more. Sure. I want to get more specific. I, I didn't want to say any details because, you know, if you feel comfortable doing that, that's fine. I just didn't <laughs> want to like... No, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate you wanting to preserve my privacy. But I'm, I'm totally okay being transparent on this one because I, I was actually the bigger dick in the situation <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, so it's so easy to turn the story into something that the brain can understand. Yeah. And what was actually happening is, uh, if you if you're a podcast listener for a while, you know that I don't have the greatest relationship with my parents, not from my choice, but from their choice. They have decided that because I didn't continue um, believing in the same religion as they believe, then uh, they're they're having a hard time seeing me as their daughter in some ways. And so, um, and, and they get really upset whenever they're around me and we don't spend very much time around each other, but whenever they're around me, like there's like a, just this really sort of underground hostility at all times. And so a lot of my self-worth and self-value, which a long time ago was very understandably wrapped up in my parents' approval and opinion of me, I've worked super duper hard to let that go and, you know, to, to recognize that I'm a person who gets to determine my own self-value and my own worth. The, the challenge is, though, that I've done that without having to be around them. As in, like, I mean, it wasn't, it's not challenging to do that work when the people who are reminding you of your lack of self-worth and value are, um, aren't around. Like, it's very easy to do that when you have some distance. The challenge is when they come back in your life and all your neural pathways and, like, all that stuff that was associated with them like all that stuff now starts to flare up because like the work I did was with distance. And now that I have closer proximity at times, now that stuff is like, I, I, you know, I'll get in a moment where I'm like, I thought I was beyond this. I thought I was past this. <laughs> but I, what I am when they're not around. But when they are around, then all that stuff starts to flare up again. And, and over time, I'm learning how to deal with that piece. But there was just this massive flare up. And it, because my self-worth and value were the question, And my parents were only around me for maybe, I don't know, like an hour and then left. And it's hard for my brain to go, okay, so, you know, the whole adage that neurons that, you know, fire together, wire together, and you've got a lot of stuff around your self-image, around your parents, and, you know, like your parents showed up, so all that, all those neural pathways started firing again, and, and that's pretty much what's going on. Like, that would be the reasonable look at the system and the nodes in the system response, but instead my brain wanted to oversimplify it and go, oh, Joel must not love me anymore. <laughs> like, we're at the beach, and there's a lot of girls who are like half my age, and haven't had children yet, and they look amazing in their bathing suits, and of 
course he's appreciating that. And so the reason why I feel the way that I do, it must be that Joel doesn't want to be with me anymore. Like he doesn't love me anymore and he'd rather be with somebody who's half my age and way better looking than me, right? Like my brain, that's like such an easy story to run to. Like, it, and it's of course bullshit, but my brain doesn't know that because my brain wants to grab the easy explanation. And that's a super easy explanation to go to. If I'm not feeling good about myself, it must be your fault, Joel. And it must be because you want something different than me. When that is like, again, that's a cause effect way of thinking that is so inaccurate. It Like I might as well have like blamed it on the bananas we were eating. Like I feel yeah. the way I do because I'm eating bananas. Like that's how arbitrary that is. When I looked at the entire system and realized, okay, so I've got some neural pathways here that need some work. I've got to figure that piece out. And it's connected to a story of mine that I normally feel like I've graduated from, but apparently he still has some vestiges in there that I've got to figure out. And because that's the system that's working inside of me, it makes sense that I'm going to, based on the context of where we're at, it kind of makes some sense that I'm not going to want to accept that and take it on for myself. I'm going to want to project that out and look for a very easy explanation, even if that easy explanation is wrong and inaccurate. Yeah. And it took a little bit of time to remind myself to zoom out. Because when you're in the moment of having a fault, like you've figured out who th- who's at fault, like the blame, who's, who's, at, who, who's the person that I can blame for this? When you find somebody that you can turn into the villain or attach blame to them, it's it's almost like your brain kind of goes, okay, whew, we figured it out, right? Like it's it's yeah. really it becomes super easy now. Oh, now I know who the pro- what the problem is. I know who the problem is, and your brain goes, okay, well, I I did all the work that I needed to do. I guess I'm done now. I figured <laughs> out the problem, yeah. and and at that point, it takes some concerted effort, especially since in those moments your emotions are flared up, and you're not. I mean, for me, my emotions were flared up, and I wasn't feeling good about myself. And my brain really didn't want to do much more work than that. Like it was done. It was like, I, I, I solved it, right? I'm out. But it's like solving a Rubik's Cube by getting like one half of, you know, like like getting one side the same color <laughs> where all the other sides are still all messed up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's like, you didn't solve anything. You just gave yourself an illusion of having solved something. And so it took a lot of emotional energy for me to remind myself to zoom out and go, you didn't solve anything, you didn't find anything. Like if you feel like there's one person to blame for your feelings right now, then you are clearly grossly oversimplifying the situation and you need to go back to looking at the system. It's so amazing how when one person in a relationship has insecurities that come up, at least for me, this happens. It's almost like a mirror. It just primes the pump for all mine to come out. So my story in in this, when you're saying, you know, Joel doesn't want me anymore, and you know, you're projecting that toward me, I'm going, oh, this is actually her telling me that she doesn't want me anymore, and she's trying to communicate that, but she doesn't know how to do it directly, and she's just upset, and oh my goodness, it's it's you know, I'm I guess she doesn't want to be with me anymore, and how can she be like this? How can she just out of the blue not want to be like I have this whole story running, and I realize as I back up. It's a lot of self-worth things around me as a man, as a, in my masculinity and showing up. And I'm like, man, maybe I'm not a good enough man for her. Maybe she wants somebody else and she's trying to you know, give me an out, quote unquote, or, or push me away or say, this is something I want over here. So I won't, you know, that, that I'll get the message. She doesn't want to tell me directly. And so I've got all this stuff coming and now I'm, all my insecurities are coming up and I'm, I'm lashing out back at you going, well, you know, why don't you just speak directly and tell me what you really want? And I'm thinking you're trying to couch something in a non-direct way. And so these nodes are running and, and really our insecurities behind us underneath the surface are what's powering some of this. And there's all sorts of different nodes that are influencing this emergent of us disagreeing and having like this back and forth of, oh, you, don't, you must not love me. You want to be out of this. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until we finally said, wait a minute, what is happening here? This is craziness. And we stopped and we regrouped and we started to think of it in terms of systems. And I think that was the the turnaround in that day and a half of us having that struggle, I guess. And I think we emerged out of it understanding some of the things about ourselves and realizing that we both own our insecurities and the nodes that are running underneath that. It's really not you that's causing me to feel insecure. And I'm not the one causing you to feel insecure. Those are things we have to deal with on our own. And so I think that was really helpful for us to see it in a systems way. So earlier I mentioned some of the systems that are generally running 
in a relationship. And if you have a couple of system templates, um, if you're not used to this style of thinking, those templates can be really helpful for like during the time period that your brain readjusts to looking at reality in what is what could be called a very profoundly different way. Like going from cause effect thinking to systems thinking is a it's like an infrastructural change in your mind. You will think very differently about everything in your life. You'll approach life differently. Very much so. So one of the easiest ways to make this shift, I think, is in relationships. Because relationships, we instinctively recognize our systems. We realize that, like, like take, for example, a family of five. Let's say that you have two parents and three kids. It's, very, it's not that counterintuitive to think that every single person in that family is a node. They're their own parts in the system. And that they're going to not only impact the entire system, but also each other. Like the relationship between two siblings, maybe that have a lot of rivalry, is going to impact the third sibling. Or it's going to impact the parents and the parents' relationship with each other if it's causing a lot of stress stress and anxiety. Like we get that systems work in relationships already. That's very intuitive for us. So if you're trying to shift your perspective from a cause effect to a systems thinking way, relationships and family dynamics is possibly one of the best ways to start. Now, going a little deeper though, what are some of the systems that cause the different emergence that that can re- require a little bit of uh, a shift in thinking as well because some of the stuff that are the most influential have a tendency to be relatively subterranean. There are things that require a little bit of digging for to find. So if you have some templates for the the basic things that influence the systems in our relationships, then it makes it a little easier to chart those back and look for some of the subterranean things. Yeah. And one of the... When I first learned systems thinking, some of the templates that were given to me is to put things down, and this is an oversimplification, but it's it's not an inaccurate oversimplification. It's an accurate one that will lead you to more complex thinking. Yeah, it's just it's like wax on, wax off, and you'll learn more as you go, but it's a good discipline to start here. Exactly. So put things down to three different primary categories, which is physical, mental, and emotional. Everything runs effectively as individuals on those three things and then think in terms of your environment and think in terms of you as an individual so then you have your physical component as an individual and you have your physical component that is environmental you have your emotional component that is you as an individual like how you're what you're feeling and then you have the emotional component that is environmental And then the same thing happens with the mental piece. It's what you're thinking, who you are psychologically as an individual, and then your environment as it's presenting psychologically. So for the physical stuff, your physical self is like, what is your health? How are you showing up as an individual in your health? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting enough water? Are you eating nutrient-dense foods? Are you exercising at a reasonable amount? Are you honoring and taking care of your physical health? And then your physical environment is what are you surrounded by? Like, what are, what's the context of your life? Is it stressful? Um, are there a lot of logistical things that don't seem to be able to be taken care of? Are there things that can be taken care of that you haven't? Um, I, I mean, I, I think in terms of physical environment, could be like, are you in the middle of a house build, right? Like, that could be very stressful. Do you live in a town where there's no access to good quality foods? You have to right. buy foods that are, you know, prepackaged, maybe because you live really out in the middle of nowhere. Right. So the first one, a house build you know that that will have an end date. So in the meantime, it's, it's stressful, but you know that it will have like a marked end and you just have to hold out for it. In the situation you're talking about, if you're not planning on moving from the town and there's no like end in sight there, it might be something that you just have to learn to live with, right? Like you just have to get creative, maybe buy stuff on Amazon or um, you know travel further for some of your foods or figure out an alternative. So taking a measure of your in, your physical environment as it is around you and figuring out what are all the parts of that that are encouraging you to have better or worse health. And so the physical things happens the same way with your body. If you're not taking care of it, then you're going to show up more stressful. So in a relationship, that still counts. What is the physical between the two of you? And what are the physical environmental factors? 
Physical between the two of you are things like, are you guys taking care of your health together? Are you taking care of your sex life together? Are you making sure that you have the physical components that make both of you happy? Are you handling those? And of course, you're going to have to self-diagnose what are the most influential parts of that for you. You're the only people who know what your sex life is. You're the only people who know what your health requirements are. So you have to figure that on your own. But that's a starting point is figuring out what are what are the different influencers that make your physical health or the physical health of the relationship um, either doing well or doing poorly. And the same thing with physical environmental factors. Physical environmental factors could be things like, um, you know, like we mentioned, like your job, like what is your commute, right? Like if one person has an hour and a half commute each way to work and the other person has a five minute the person who has the five minute may not understand the stress that the person who has the hour and a half commute each way is experiencing. Yeah. That could be something that is a strain on the relationship itself that nobody would really think of. Or if the person's like, well, I just had this really long commute, the person who doesn't have the long commute might undervalue how important that is and how much stress it's bringing to the relationship. Or maybe the climate you're in. Maybe you work outdoors in a cold climate and your spouse or lover works indoors or stays at home with children and they don't understand the stresses you might be under in a physical way outdoors all day that's causing you to feel worn down and stressful and tired. And that's an influencer in a physical environment that's external of you. Yeah. And resource would also come into the physical environmental piece, which is, uh, do you have enough resource coming in? Do you have enough financial resource coming in in order to handle the basic necessities? And if not, that's also going to cause tension between the two of you. So again, you're going to have to diagnose what the nodes in your system are. You're going to have to figure those out because they're individualized to you. But think of them under those two categories, the physical piece, like the internal physical piece of the relationship the dynamic between the two of you, and then the external factors. And then you move on to emotional internal versus emotional external. So emotional, just think of that as the relationship itself. What is the heart relationship? Are you making sure to keep your interactions, your emotional interactions between each other to be as positive as possible? So things like, are you making sure that you have date night? Are you making sure that you are uh, aware and conscientious of each other's love languages? Yeah. How, how are you speaking to each other? Are you speaking with kindness? Are you trying to speak with the most gentle way to say things? Or are you speaking in a very triggering, accusatory, or you know, projecting ill intent onto the person just in the way your tonality comes out? That, that could be a huge emotional piece. Yeah. Are you staying connected? Not just in good communication, but as Bruce mentioned in his podcast, connected. Yeah. Um, and so th- I think this is the one component that we hyper focus on in relationships. The internal emotional piece, the relation, the dynamic between the two people is where we tend to land. It seems like what it orbits around. Yeah. And so we're, we're usually more aware of this piece. And I think we're less aware of the other components being just as important. But again, you're going to have to self-diagnose what are the nodes in that? Are you not feeling cherished and loved by your spouse? And what, what are some of the reasons why? And don't, don't discount that it might be some of the, you know, these other things we're talking about. Yeah. Like your spouse is not acknowledging the stress of a long commute or whatever it is. So the emotional piece is something that we tend to hyper-focus on. But some of the reasons why we're feeling what we're feeling in that space could have nothing to do with the internal emotional piece. It could have something to do with the external physical piece. And then the external emotional are the relationships that surround you. So take, for example, in-laws. In-laws are a big one. <laughs> yeah. Or friends. You know, like you you marry each other, but you also have these like this batch of friends that comes with a relationship. Well, and those nodes also shift. Like let you take the in-law thing, for example. Let's say a baby comes into the relationship. Well, now the in-law's relationship dynamic with you has altered because now they're invested maybe in this new grandchild of theirs on both sides, that adds a whole nother layer of complication in, in the system that's running. So like that's, a, that's an example of something that might be running well for a while. Like You have a great relationship with your mother-in-law, but all of a sudden the baby comes along and now, now my relationship with my mother-in-law is strained and now my relationship with my spouse is strained. Oh my goodness, Like this is not fun at all and I'm having a lot of struggle here emotionally. Yeah, and in those moments, you might project it onto your spouse, right? Because... Well, it's your mom (laughs) and she's causing me havoc and hell. So now you and me, now we're restrained. So these are really important things to keep keep track of, keep your finger on the pulse of. Sometimes we project problems onto our spouses that have nothing to do with them and have everything to do with other components and, and very much create distinctions around this. 
one of the biggest challenges that we have is we have a tendency to conflate everything together and see them all as sort of the same thing. If I'm having a struggle with my mother-in-law, somehow that is the exact same thing as having a struggle with my spouse. But it's not. They're two very different things. And what we can do to influence the relationship with the mother-in-law is different than the things that we can do to influence our relationship with our spouse potentially. So it's also creating these distinctions, these clear distinctions that go, yeah, I might be blaming the wrong person or the wrong thing because it's easy to do. You know, I can't tell my mother-in-law off. That'll just create you know, a ton more problems, but I can tell my spouse off and I got all the steam I got to vent because I'm so pissed off about this other situation. So I'm just going to blast it all on my spouse because I know they'll be there at the end of the day, which of course only erodes the relationship we have with them. So you're looking at another node in the system and getting pissed off at it and doing nothing about it and then attacking a completely different node that will never be the solution like attacking them and letting off some steam, like the node of needing to let off steam might feel better, but the node of the the emotional interaction between you and your spouse is now way worse. So you've got to work with these systems in a way that honors that you're not going to, you're not going to rob from one node to pay to another one. Like the node of needing to let off some steam, you know, go get a punching bag and, you know, punch the hell out of that. Don't punch the hell out of your spouse you know, verbally, (laughs) that's not going to work. So recognizing that these are very distinct, different nodes and the node that's having the challenge, that's the node that needs to be attended to, not a different one. So if the node is the in-law, then that's the node that needs attention in whatever way, either you go address it or you make peace with it or whatever it is. But that's the important thing about these systems is that you uh, you don't try to solve something in the system that has nothing to do with the actual, you know, the actual challenge. Yeah, there's there's two, like really two parts to it. It's the awareness of it and then it's the courage to deal with the awareness that you have now. <laughs> so you find out that it's that note of maybe your mother-in-law and you're nervous. You don't feel like you can say something maybe or or maybe you can say something, but you don't say it in a very gentle way. You say it more caustic because you just don't, you're not calibrated to be able to say it in a way because you feel really insecure about it. And you might say something that triggers your mother-in-law, makes it even worse. And the courage to be able to address that or the ability and the skill set, the finesse might be something you have to build, but it's something that takes courage, practice, intention. And that's that's a whole nother thing beyond just being aware of it in the first place. So there's, and you can start seeing how this, again, gets way complicated. As you look at this, you're like, man, this starts to get, I, I want to just forget what you guys are saying, Joel and Antonia. Already, you're not even your third your third element yet. You've been <laughs> to two of these, and this seems like my mind is going to be like overwhelmed by it. I'm going to go back to cause and effect because it's yeah. just way more easy to see it that way than what you guys are proposing. This is insanity to me. Yeah, it's easier for me to think my husband's a dick. <laughs> That's just way easier. <laughs> or my wife is just a jerk. <laughs> That's way easier to, do, to to work with. But again, when you when you start thinking in this way, like you mentioned, Joel you will see opportunities for the need to build certain skills. And if you can rise to the challenge of building those skills and actually addressing some of these, you know, some of these nodes that need better influences from you, then all of a sudden things, I mean, when an emergent from a system starts to go well, it feels like magic. It feels like you're not even quite sure what you did. Just everything seems to now be working out. And because you got it at its root source, it's now sustainable. Like it lasts. It's not like a painting over or turning a blind eye or getting, you know, venting your frustration and you feel better for the moment, but actually you ended up like ultimately eroding some of the respect between the two of you. Like it's not a quick fix. It's a long-term sustainable fix, which is why these, you know, systems thinking is so powerful. And so the third piece of this, when you're looking for some templates or some ways to diagnose some of these nodes in your life, is the uh, the intellectual p- component or the psychological component in the relationship. So these could be shared beliefs. Uh, they could be shared interests. They could be the things you guys talk about and what you bring to the table as far as your values go. Yeah, or even Graves levels, you know, Graves level, spiral dynamic levels, you might be stratified there, your spouse or you might be advancing faster than the other person and that can cause a dynamic shift. So these are all different nodes when you're talking about the intellectual piece, mindset, how well, how willing you are to look at your like introspection, how much one of you probably has a higher threshold for introspection than the other one. That's a node in the system. 
One of you probably has the ability to hold more mental space or deal with harder truths than the other person. So these things play into all of the dynamics in the relationship that are going to cause conflict or cause things to not be working out as well. Yeah, I would argue that personality types fall into this category. Absolutely. Right. And so kind of understanding, you know, we just did two podcasts on dichotomies and cognitive functions, like my understanding Myers-Briggs typology as it relates to relationships. And I think that those would fall under this. This is sort of the conscious or cognizant co- component of the dynamic between the two. Culture? What and, culture you came from? Well, and that's the integrated part, but I would I would say that that's also the external psychological piece. I mean, the, the culture you come from is probably the internal part, but the culture you're living in is the external part. Yeah. And what's interesting is that during this time period in history, we've gone through a very, in the United States, we and actually globally, people are going through a really interesting sort of a strained political environment in all of the developed countries. It feels like this is not just United States. This is all over the world. And because of that, I mean, in the election, I, I read an article recently that there's a percentage of divorces that happened based on one person telling the other person, if you vote for this person, I'm going to divorce you. And then they followed through with it. Yeah. So this would be like sort of the external psychological component that we're in. And those influence us. If who you vote for in an election will cause you to break up with your spouse to divorce them, that means that wasn't just your internal, the internal dynamic of the psychological component. That was the pressures of the outside world's belief systems, values, etc., coming into and intruding on the relationship itself. Some of these people were together for decades, 30, 40 years, and they were fine until this note all of a sudden came out of the blue entered into the system and created a completely different emergent. Just this one node just caused all this trauma and turmoil for people. Well, and I would say that that's the most obvious piece, but I bet there was other stuff. Well, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And what it was is the relationship between that node and the other nodes in the system. And so so you kind of see where, like, I just went to more of a cause and effect thinking right there. Like, you see that? Like, it's so easy for us as people, for me to go, yeah, well, look, the one node caused all this. Even we're talking about systems thinking. We're unpacking it for you as you're listening. And still my mind, and I'm actually trying to communicate this to you, and it went to the cause and effect thinking. That's how much wiring it is in our brains, how much it's pervasive, and how we think that even I did it here on this podcast as I'm talking about it. Yeah, it's so easy. Well, and the article presented it that way. They got divorced because one person voted for somebody that the other person didn't want them to vote for. And there's no way that that was the sum total of it. They probably, in the emotional internal component, had not made sure that they were connected enough. In the internal psychological component, they were not having the healthiest conversations. And there may be other components that were not as healthy as they could have been. But it's really easy to forget those things until something drastic or dramatic or kind of horrifying happens to the relationship. And then instead of deconstructing it and looking at all the different influencers in those categories that we've been talking about, it's easy to say, well, you voted for this person, so I'm divorcing you. Yeah, I think there's a nuance here then that I would posit to you as you're listening. There's the difference between a cause and a catalyst. There's a there's a much different... So the cause of a car starting, you know, a car, a vehicle turning on, it's not a cause. There's an entire system that creates the vehicle to start up, to fire up the engine to start. The catalyst is me sticking my key in the ignition and turning the key. It's a catalyst for the system to kick off a different chain of reactions. So I think that's a, that's a key nuanced difference here in your relationship. A big difference between causes for things and catalysts for a bunch of nodes that create a different emergent. Yeah, that, I think that that is an incredibly important distinction to make. And I'm, I'm grateful that you made that. So if, if you find yourself thinking like, I'm not feeling good in my relationship, I'm not feeling loved or wanted, etc., one of the best ways that you can stop yourself from simply projecting blame onto your spouse and turning them into the villain is instead of thinking the word cause, think the word catalyst. What was the catalyst that started me thinking this way? And of course, we're talking about this in terms of the relationship and the dynamic between the two people. But I think as every individual enters the world and influences the world around them and is influenced by the world around them, all three of those categories and the two subcategories so I'm talking about physical, emotional, and mental, and internal and external, you've got to make sure the system of you is running well. So the first thing that I would do if I was 
you know, listening to this podcast and kind of trying to reframe how I saw systems is the first thing that I personally would do is write down a, a chart of physical, mental, emotional, internal, external. And then I would write all the different things that I believe about myself in those, in those six different categories. What do I think are the influencers? How, how do I feel I'm doing in all of that? And then once I got a pretty good idea of myself, then I would sit down to diagnose what's going on between me and my spouse. Because if I'm bringing something to the relationship, like take, for example, my, my challenge of feeling self-worth and value around my relationship with my parents, that's totally me. That's mine. That's my internal emotional, right? And if I bring that piece into the relationship and project my, feeling, my, my feelings of lacking worth or value onto you, Joel, then now I'm bringing some of my stuff and, and tossing it into the relationship and calling it yours. Yeah. Which is not, it's not reality. Like, it doesn't matter whether or not it's fair. It doesn't matter whether or not it's like, I mean, all, all of the things that could be said about it, that it's unfair to you. It's not something I should be doing. But for me, the thing that's the most disturbing is that it's just simply not true. <laughs> it's just not reality. And I want to work in the realm of reality. So that's what's nice about systems and determining the nodes of the individual that you are and then determining the nodes of the relationship and then taking it even bigger and looking at an entire family dynamic is that you can actually go down and diagnose some of the things that are causing are the catalyst to things that we don't particularly want, emergence we don't want. And then we can go influence those parts of those nodes. Yeah. And then once we influence and change them, now it's like our entire life just starts to change because the emergent happens, again, feels, feeling like magic. Yeah, and I think we, we couch this in the framework so far as, okay, there might be a challenge in your relationship or struggle or disagreements, and here's how you quote unquote can fix it or make it better or improve it or optimize it. I would also tell you too that this can be used for the things you want in life. Let's say you are a single person listening right now and you would love a romantic relationship that was fulfilling and connective and sexy and passionate. And you can sit down and you can write out all the different nodes in the system of what the emergent of you not having that in your life right now is. Or if you wanted that emergent, what would it look like? What would all the nodes that would need to be running to create the emergent of that person that you could be madly in love with? What would it look like? What would the things in place have to be? Which gives you, again, that sense of empowerment. Oh, I want this type of woman in my life, so I'll write down all the different nodes of running in my, in my life right now, and I realize that a big node in the system is I am at home every day. I'm not going out <laughs> at night, you know. <laughs> I'm not going out to meet people or connect with anyone. I'm not in any social circles. I'm not reaching out and even making friends with anyone. That's got to be a big node. Then you start to unpack that and make all the different nodes around your social life and where you're at in that. And you can start to see a map emerge of some areas of your life you might want to put some attention to to create a different emergent that you do want. So it's not always about fixing things or, or solving problems. It can also be about designing the life or the emergence you want to have happen as well. Yeah, and that would be an example of external physical. Yeah. Like, I'm just not going out. Yeah. Um, and what's again, what's nice about it is that it doesn't have to necessarily be a blame game situation. It can just be, like, what are the things that I want to, you know, optimize? This is just a fact. Yeah. Like, this I'm, is... I'm tired after work, and I'm, I want to just sit at home and read and watch TV or whatever. I don't want to have to go out. It's no, there's no fault here. I just hasn't been there yet. And now I got to figure out a way to generate more energy to go out and meet people. Yeah, I got to like focus on my incentive or whatever. <laughs> so yeah, I think that that's, I think that that's probably the healthiest way of looking at it. You're right. When we talk about relationships, we oftentimes, you know, assume that anytime you're looking at an emergent, it's got to be like some sort of problem or negative emergent. But it could just be like you said, it's just a way to design your life. It's one of the best ways to design your life to have uh, the emotions that you want to experience, the relationships you want to experience, all the emergence that you want to experience. This is one of the best ways to actively go in and retool your life. Like does, it is probably the easiest way to get to a designer life is by looking at these things in terms of systems. So what do you think? And we've been talking about systems thinking in terms of relationship. Have you been thinking or playing with this already in your life? Are you the type of person that tends to just be very cause and effect and project onto somebody else or other things externally or even onto yourself. You just beat up on yourself and say, well, I'm, the, I'm at fault here. Or are you seeing how you can shift into this idea that there are multiple nodes, multiple things running that are creating the emergent that's happening for you? 
And you can take control of that and influence a different direction by focusing on the things that can be changeable and influenceable. We would love to hear your feedback. We want you to be part of this conversation. You can do that over at personalityhacker.com. You can leave a comment or ask a question directly below this show. And you can also join our community of like minds over at facebook.com forward slash personality hacker or twitter.com forward slash personality hack. We want your voice rep- represented there too, because we feel like as you're listening to this, as you're growing and developing, again, you're, you're part of a community of like minds, people that want to see the world in a different way, see their life in a different way, and put attention and intention into growing as people. So we're really excited to have you as part of this podcast and the community. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. And if you're feeling particularly giving, if you would leave us a rating and review, that would be lovely. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we will talk with you on the next Personality Hacker podcast. Mm-hmm.